Okay. Are you ready to go? Okay. All right. We're going to start off with um, with Misha Alexeyev, the New Water's Edge: Why Trump's Bid to Improve U.S.-Russian Relations Backfired in Congress. Thank you, uh, Josh. And Josh already outlined the main paradox that I examine, which I call the 2017 Russia sanctions surprise, where the uh, expected uh, softening or lifting of sanctions turned out into uh, a un near unanimous vote uh, in uh, the Senate, 98 to 2, and in the House of Representatives, 419 to 3. Uh, signing into law the legislation that reaffirmed sanctions on Russia in connection with its intervention in Ukraine and Syria and interfering with the US presidential election. And also, uh, it was part of the bill titled Russia Sanctions Review Act of 2017, which made all sanctions on Russia significantly hard to lift uh, for any president uh, of the United States. So why is it? Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the question uh, that, that I ask myself, and kind of uh, going back to my American uh, foreign policy days and seminars with Don Matthews in American government back at the UW, you know, mm -hmm. on, on these things, clearly you have to consider the role of Congress as an institutional actor uh, in US foreign policy. And one of the first questions to ask was, well, you know, um, of what is this an instance? What kind of broader phenomena is it? that may help us to understand the making of US foreign policy in more general terms and project it to you know, other cases of relations with Russia, other countries, and, and so on. Uh, well, one first uh, uh, hurdle to clear was to simply, uh, you have to uh, clear the very simple explanation, well, what if uh, this kind of uh, unanimous uh, voting reflected some sort of shift in public opinion, uh, and given the natural concerns of uh, lawmakers about being elected, uh, then it would uh, simply explain. And then actually, if you look at the public opinion trends uh, with regard to foreign policy in the United States after Trump's election, you will see that they go the opposite way. They actually go toward increasing polarization, uh, including issues like Russia and Russia investigation uh, with Trump supporters and Republicans. In fact, increasing favorable views of Putin from 12% uh, in February 2015 to 32% in February 2017. So the Trump election actually boosts the support for Putin among the Republican base. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and on other issues as well. And we actually saw a flip-flop. Uh, viewing Russia as an adversary used to be uh, more of a Republican thing than the Democratic thing. It became more of a Democratic thing than the Republican thing after the Trump election. Uh, so these kinds of uh, shifts in public opinion, all the, at, at the same time, um, among the uh, self -vote voters of both parties, you had generally a preference for status quo. Uh, not do anything about sanctions, just kind of leave them where they are. So given the fact that these, these trends are there, you would not expect uh, public opinion to put pressure on Congress. So then why? Then why is, is there such an overwhelming vote? So, um, uh, and if you look at the literature, you would think, you know, my first instinct was that I would have to spend a lot of time reading a lot of research studies uh, on congressional politics, that there would be, of course, as the, with the scholars of American government, a lot of quantitative studies, great rich data, I would need to go through some, you know, statistical findings, mm -hmm. right? No, <laughs> uh, because the, the issue, uh, the, if, if, you, if you see the nature of the issue, it's, bipartisan opposition to the president on foreign policy. And if you look at most of these studies, they're about bipartisan support for the president on foreign policy. How presidents use the argument, the kind of realist argument that politics ends at water's edge, hence my title, and therefore Republicans and Democrats should unite behind the administration's foreign policy push, say, you know, Iraq war, or Vietnam, or whatever. And so uh, where does this uh, bipartisan opposition fit in and how, what would explain periodic surges, uh, not necessarily very frequent, of bipartisan opposition to uh, presidential authority. So I come with, uh, after the review of the literature, I come with three um, main factors that explain it, uh, and they address also different dimensions. So one is issue nature, which talks about the constitu which goes to the constitutional design of the American politics. The second one is elite opinion, 
which goes more toward the congressional political dynamics of Congress as an institution separate from broader public opinion even. And then the third one is executive volatility, the uh, risk aversion uh, factor that uh, talks about the interaction between the uh, executive leadership and the legislative leadership. So that's where you have the, the kind of Trump effect. So you have the, the longer term broader effects, the institutional congressional effects, and then the impact of Trump uh, on, on, on these dynamics. Uh, and the first uh, uh, factor is what I call issue nature. One thing is very important to consider is the nature of foreign policy issue. In other words, not on every issue you're going to have that kind of congressional merging or, uh, and, and, and foreign policy is particularly sensitive to that uh, issue um, dynamic uh, as Edward Corwin in his book The President Long, Long Term Study from 1787 to 1957 of Presidential Powers and Congress said which of these organs, meaning the presidency or the Congress, shall have the decisive and final voice in determining the course of the American nation is left for events to resolve because, as he argued, that um, the Constitution confers certain powers on the President and certain powers on the House and the Senate to conduct foreign affairs and, and that is all that it does. So there is, there is not much beyond that and the, then the flow of events is very important. So that, that's the thing. So the uh, um, one study that actually uh, was consistent with the view on the importance of sanctions. The sanctions become a particularly interesting issue here. And that's, the, in, in a sense, that the sanctions, given the nature of congressional authority under the Constitution, uh, present the kind of platform where members of Congress are more likely to act as supporters of their institution rather than of their party. So the institutional affiliation becomes more important than party affiliation uh, in, in that sense. Uh, and one, um, um, you know, there is one study that actually systematically looked at this dynamic with respect to sanction. Uh, Jordan Tama, a political scientist who also was the congressional aide um, working on Magnitsky Act, he looked at uh, um, the Clinton, Bush, and Obama presidencies and um, the, the sanctions uh, on Iran, uh, non proliferation, China currency, Russian human rights. And what the common, the common denominator in those is that. Uh, you had then bipartisan opposition to the president, uh, and a c common congressional world view emerged that was distinct from the pr president's. Uh, it, and it was regardless of who occupied the White House or which party was in power at that particular time. So that you, you compare it across administrations and across presidencies and, and, and across um, different configurations of party. Uh, domination of the House and the Senate, then, 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 then um, the same common denominator emerges from there. Uh, the interest groups, interestingly enough, uh, also he looked at those, you know, what if it's uh, particular interest groups. Um, in the Russian case, we can think of, say, the energy uh, industry. Uh, but what transpires through looking systematically at those cases was that um, the economic issues and, and lobbying mattered uh, but only regarding countries with whom the United States had high level of economic interdependence. So they were influential on China and restricting China sanctions drives, but they were not influential on Iran and on Magnitsky Act. Um, now, um, the second um, big factor uh, is what I call uh, the elite opinion uh, and um, in fact, there was a study, this is where there was one systematic study, uh, of roll calls in Congress from 1975 to 1996 by political scientists uh, Mark Suva and David Rode, and they found that convergence of views among partisan elites was a stronger predictor of bipartisan voting on foreign policy than perceptions of international level threats uh, and presidential uh, priorities. Uh, and in the, this particular case with Russia's sanctions, um, I can call that there was this intermestic convergence uh, of elite views uh, between, uh, it was driven primarily by the Republican uh, 
a traditional elite view viewing Russia as a geopolitical threat, but, it, but combined with it was the view from the Democrats who viewed it as a domestic issue that you know, led to the losing of the <coughs> elections. Just to give you a few quotes, you know, and they were very similar statements by people like John McCain, Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan specifically said in one Fox interview, Russia is a menace, a global menace led by a man who is menacing. The Russians are up to no good. We all know that. Uh, and then showing, uh, and even when, when, when they were asked, well, wouldn't that damage some economic interests of US corporations? Ryan actually, instead of saying, well, there might be potential trade offs, so no, no, we're going to do sanctions in such a way that they would not inadvertently help Russian oligarchs and oil firms. Right? So, so much for the Exxon and Tillerson influence. Uh, in, and the Democrats, you know, Schumer actually collaborated quietly with the Republicans of that, so the, the legislation that they crafted wouldn't be tainted among their party base with, with Democratic cooperation. Meanwhile, more prominent Democrats, in general statements, uh, raised the issue. Uh, one of the big issues for them on the sanctions uh, process was that uh, cyber attacks on the United States were threatening, in the words of Senator Chris Van Holland from Maryland, to undermine public faith in the democratic process. Therefore, it was necessary to work across the aisle, put patriotism over partisanship. And that's how this thing emerged. And so one other Democratic senator, uh, uh, sorry, Congressman Kushner said, sanction the KGB, sanctions Mr. Putin, sanction Russia. They are, in fact, here to demolish democracy of this nation. So, you know, the truth speaks through the eyes, through the you know, mouths of elected representatives. Now, finally, uh, finally, uh, the volatility. Uh, the volatility, it's not just those midnight or middle of the night pre-dawn tweets uh, that you have, but they do have an effect as well. But the effect is not necessarily the specific content of, this, of, of the tweets, but what it does to the notion of the party ideological center. It's important in Congress for party members to kind of know where the center is, where that position is, where you hang your hat. Pres executive volatility like that of your own party reduces that idea, so it creates the incentive to work out your own ideological center and stick to it that would be kind of distinct from the presidency. So, uh, the, uh, uh, another thing, and, and finally on this, uh, the, uh, that the Trump administration challenged congressional authority which they cared about uh, in two ways. The public way in which uh, it was challenged, and it was obvious, was that uh, he was calling Putin the strong, good leader, that good relations with Russia would be wonderful, so it, the implications that you know, sanctions could be. But on the other hand, during confirmation hearings uh, in the Senate, of which, of course, all the Congress people were privately uh, very knowledgeable, and they probably could get a better feel than just the words and the statements, uh, people like Mattis and Tillerson, uh, they believed struck a much hard, harder position, down to supporting uh, arming Ukraine, providing more weapons to Ukraine uh, to uh, resist uh, and repel Russian military invasion. And so uh, uh, from that standpoint, there was a double sense of threat that whichever way, we don't know, Trump is volatile, and yet there are those two extreme versions that may happen. So perhaps before anything else happens, we kind of strike the Goldilocks uh, legislation, neither too hot nor too cold, which actually has been a pattern in Congress anyway, on defense debates and on a lot of other debates. And here we have it. So here we have. Finally, there was one other little factor that, yeah, that is uh, um, Thomas' research showed also played a role in, in, in the debates on Magnitsky. Uh, sanctions, uh, the so-called um, external threat of external ret retaliation. If members of Congress feel, get the signs that what they do are going to invoke some retaliatory acts, especially from a foreign government, they're actually more likely to do <laughs> what they started to do. And since Russia was really a beat on well, if you impose sanctions, we would impose counter, counter sanctions, you know, they, they were this quick tit for tat responses. That set the stage also for determination. So finally, one big take out of this. So it's not that, as one observer wrote, the sanctions were imposed, the sanctions law was imposed to prevent, I quote, an apparently bumbling, bumbling self-absorbed and ineffective president from, another quote, implementing a major change in US foreign policy. It's way more than that. It has the institutional dynamic. It's also way more than the Russia gate. It, I think it also sh indicates some big changes, shifts, 
in, 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 in the, um, first of all, in the institutional configuration of US foreign policy. There are those phases that scholars note when Congress is more active and has more say in the presidency. As we'll say. So then there, there was a shift toward the presidency. We may see a swing back toward Congress. That's one, one uh, take. And the other one is to what extent uh, you know, there, there, there are those new geopolitical threats that are, that are coming. That there may be a growing understanding that the threat of great power competition uh, and uh, uh, threats to security from that competition are maybe more important to pay attention to than things like anti-terrorism. And so uh, those appeals for cooperation on <coughs> anti-terrorism measures may be dwindling away, which I also, by the way, notice among my students. See, if, if I, I, I have the litmus test. I, I mentioned something like 9-11, it used to energize everybody, even five years ago, but now they seem to be totally flat. They just, it's like 9-11 never happened. Anyway, maybe not the same in New York, I would understand that, certainly. Uh, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Tim Fry from Columbia University is going to present on economic sanctions and public opinion survey experiments from Russia. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, uh, Josh and, and, and Ponars, for, for having me. I'll stand up if that's okay. Um, so, um, uh, actually, maybe I better sit down. That might be better. This money is rare. New York is too small. <laughs> Tim, you can go to the end if you want to stand up. Oh, actually, so if you don't okay. mind, yeah, that would be great. Uh, just, yeah, just yeah, so if you want to move. Actually, no, I can do it from here. That's right. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, um, uh, the motivation here is that sanctions are becoming an increasingly common tool. Um, and, uh, uh, but one of the problems is we don't have a lot of data about their impact on public opinion in the countries that are targeted. It's not very easy to do surveys in countries like North Korea, Somalia, Sudan, <laughs> the countries where most likely to fall under sanctions. And indeed, in autocracies, uh, non-democracies, is where the action is taking place. 85% of sanctions in, uh, in the last 30, 40 years have been in non-democracies rather than in democracies. So it's hard to understand how the public perceives um, uh, sanctions. Now you might say, oh, well, who cares about sanctions? These are non-democracies. You know, who, sorry, who cares about public opinion? Um, uh, these are non-democracies. Well, I mean, if the way we think that sanctions are supposed to work is that they lead the public to withdraw support from the government, or and other people think that sanctions produce this rally around the flag effect, then actually we do want to understand how the public perceives sanctions, particularly because autocratic leaders often try to use the sanctions in a way to sway public opinion uh, to build support. So the impact of sanctions on public opinion is something that we talk a lot about, we theorize a lot about a lot, but we don't have a lot of data. Now, in comes Russia. Russia is this great case because we can do good uh, public opinion research in Russia. Sanctions are very high profile. Everybody uh, knows about them, and we have this paradox according to some, that the sanctions are in place, but yet we see Putin um, having these very high approval ratings, so clearly the two must be uh, linked. Okay, so I'm going to look at uh, four uh, questions about the impact of sanctions on public opinion in Russia. And the first is the classic one, right? Um, is that do sanctions um, lead publics in the targeted countries to withdraw support from the government, which is usually the argument that proponents of sanctions make, uh, or uh, do they provoke a backlash uh, that allows the leader to then build up their own support, which is an argument that critics of sanctions often uh, put into place. Right? So here's uh, uh, one quote from then advisor to President Trump, Anthony Scaramucci, um, who went on to become much more famous than he was at, at this time. But he says about this backlash effect, this rally around the flag, I think the sanctions had in some way an opposite effect because of Russian culture. The Russians would eat snow if they had to survive. And for me, the sanctions probably galvanized the nation with the nation's president. That's actually, Strikingly similar what Putin said on North Korea. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, so one question is, you know, what's the direct effect of reminding people about, the, about sanctions? Does this increase or decrease support for the Russian government? Um, another question we might consider is whether or not people who support uh, 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 or more supportive of Putin and people who are less supportive of Putin, maybe reminding them about the sanctions produces different kinds of responses. So maybe the Putin supporters rally around the flag and the Putin skeptics withdraw their support. You know, that's a possibility um, as well. Um, 
Another uh, thing that's nice is uh, in the EU uh, U.S. sanctions on Russia is we get to figure out whether reminding people about the EU sanctions or the U.S. sanctions um, has any different impact, right? So do people respond differently when you remind them that the EU has sanctioned Russia from whether or not uh, the U.S. has sanctioned uh, uh, Russia? Um, uh, another question is whether or not sanctions work through economic effects. Right, so we can remind people that sanctions are having an impact on the Russian economy and see whether or not that has an impact on how they uh, view their own government. Um, uh, but it could be that sanctions work through a diff completely different channel. It could be that you know, people think Russia is a great power and it shouldn't be sanctioned because of that and there's some kind of, you know, you know, they're just kind of, um, uh, kind of, they react negatively to it, even apart from the economic impacts, right? So that's one another thing that we're going to try to uh, uh, test. So, I mean, I don't need to go into the, the details very much about the, the sanctions, uh, but I think an important thing is that they were targeted to not have an effect on uh, public opinion, right? So they were targeted at individuals and large corporations who were doing business in Crimea or had some role in the uh, events in eastern Ukraine. Um, however, there's a lot of evidence that the Russian public does not like the sanctions. And it, over time, there's been more evidence that the Russian public thinks that sanctions are having an impact on the Russian economy, um, in part because you know, there's been an economic slowdown um, in Russia. Um, OK, I don't think we need to talk too much about that. The Russian counter sanctions. Um, also, uh, it's hard for the Russian public to figure out what the sanctions really are, in part because it's all just one big uh, uh, bucket of sanctions. You know, the sanctions imposed by the US and then the uh, sanctions imposed by uh, the Russian government. So Navalny has this line where he says that the US and the Russian sanctions were symmetrical in that the US sanctions hit the Russian upper class and the Russian sanctions yeah. hit the Russian middle class. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, I, so I did two surveys in uh, um, uh, November 2016 and in January 2017. Um, so 2,000 respondents. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to um, we're going to ask uh, one group of respondents just on a scale of one to five, where one is very negative and five is very positive. To what extent do you uh, uh, approve of the leadership of Russia? Then the next question is, um, do you approve of the leadership of the United States? And then do you approve of the leadership of the EU? OK, so that's the one sixth of the respondents get this baseline treatment with no additional information. OK? Could you translate, please? Rukovodstva. Uh, so, so this is leadership. It's a little complicated because you know, the EU doesn't have a government. Uh, uh, and the Russian, when you say, it, it, Russian doesn't translate government directly either, so I just used the word rukovodstvo, which is a general word for the leadership of these three different bodies. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so then um, another group of respondents randomly chosen was told, since 2014 the U.S. has levied san economic sanctions against Russia. Right? And then they're asked again these three questions about support for Russia, the U.S., and the EU. Uh, another group gets this question, since 2014 there's been about a 6% decline in the Russian economy. So here we're just reminding people that the Russian economy has gone down to try to figure out whether that has any impact on how they view the Russian government, the US, and the EU. Um, then we combine these two treatments to try to say, hey, look, since 2014, the US has levied economic sanctions, and there's been a decline in the Russian economy. So here we're trying to link these two together to see if that changes people's opinions. Then we do the same thing with the European Union. So since 2014, the EU has levied economic sanctions against Russia, and then we combine the two effects, okay? And what we're going to do is compare each of these individually with this baseline condition where we don't give them any information at all, right? Yeah. Did, did you, just very quick. Yeah. Did you do any, um, like, pre-testing or follow-up testing on China, or what were you thinking people were going to think of when they heard since 2014? Like, what, what do you think is popping into people's well, heads when they well, just hear that? This is, this is the first year that sanctions were introduced. Right. So, I mean... I'm going to get to, to I think, what I think you're getting at. 2014 was a very eventful year in Russia. I was actually thinking in the second treatment, right? In the second treatment, oh, I would yeah, just be yeah, curious, yeah. when you say, in 2017, okay, yeah. when you say since 2014, right. what do you think that that's framing in people's Right, mind? right. So, I mean, in my mind, this was the drop in the oil prices when you do start to see, you know, the big decline after, you know, this, 
gradual decline becomes a much smoother <coughs> decline. Okay. So just so people know, understand how to read this chart, right? If the baseline tree, if telling people this new information had no effect, then these dots would be right along this line here. There would be no effect at all. And if the lines, this is just a measure of how confident we can be that we're actually capturing the effect. And what we can see is this doesn't seem to have any real effect. There's a slight, about 10 percentage points difference between, you know, not giving people any information and telling them that the U.S. sanction uh, had been put in place. Um, uh, 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 so there's really not any difference that we can say uh, exists when we tell people the U.S. has levied sanctions for the impact on the Russian government. What does have a big impact is if you tell people about the economic decline. Then we get a very large, you know, 30, 35 <coughs> percentage point uh, difference, and that's statistically uh, significant. Telling people about the EU sanctions, again, um, there's a slight drop, but it's not different from the baseline condition. So what we can just take, the main takeaway here is that telling people about the, the, the US sanctions or about the EU sanctions doesn't really shift their views at all from the baseline condition, but telling about the economic decline uh, does quite a bit. Okay. So then we break this into two groups to make it a little more complicated. Um, but the main point here is that there's very little difference um, uh, uh, among, when you ask me, among Putin supporters telling that the U.S. is sanctioned or the EU is sanctioned has no effect at all. We do see a considerable withdrawal among people who are more skeptical of Putin when you tell them uh, that the U.S. has imposed sanctions. So here, uh, 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 the notion is that um, uh, reminding people about the sanctions for people <coughs> who are, uh, uh, you know, Putin skeptics, this is good news for them. This leads them to withdraw their support uh, from the Russian government more than if you don't give them any information at all. Uh, and the same, it's, it's a little bit less true for the EU as well. But we see that all of the differences, all of the declines are really due to people who are more skeptical uh, of Putin. Okay. Um, is there any difference between, uh, 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 oh, sorry. Oh, the other point is that there's really no difference between how people respond when you tell them about the EU is sanctioned or the US has sanctioned. There's really very little uh, difference um, there. Okay. So how do sanctions influence support for the sanctioner, right? <clears throat> so here, if you remind Russians that the US has levied sanctions, it's not that surprising you get a big decline in, um, uh, 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 support, in an approval of, uh, uh, of the U.S., okay? And that comes mostly from Putin supporters. Um, change in support for EU leadership, again, we see a drop <coughs> of about 15 percentage points, and it's marginally, marginally significant. So not that surprising, reminding people that the U.S. or the EU has levied sanctions against Russia reduces approval for both the U.S. and for uh, the EU. So um, just initial results, no direct evidence of this strong rally around the flag effect. Also, no strong evidence of people withdrawing their support um, from the, the government. Sanctions reduce support for the US or the EU, not surprisingly. There's not much difference in, in telling people whether the EU is sanctioned or the US is sanctioned. And what's nice in this case is the sanctions are basically identical. Uh, the EU and the US sanctions are closely coordinated and they're almost the exact same sanctions, so we can really isolate the effect of the identity of, of the sender, and we do get some partisan uh, effects, okay? But wait, there's more. Um, so one of the things that puzzled me was, okay, it's just surprising to me that, we, that reminding people about the sanctions um, didn't really have any impact on people's support for the Russian government. And I thought, I, I, I expected to find some kind of rally around the flag effect and I didn't really see it. So I was trying to figure out what was going on. So I did another survey in January 2017 where we first repeated the, the question to see whether or not there was any difference in the results. Um, and then I asked a number of follow-up questions to see what might be going on, right? So again, we see this question. Since 2014, the US has levied economic sanctions against Russia. And again, we'll compare that to the baseline condition when we don't give anybody any information. Um, then I, I, we said, since 2014, the US has levied economic sanctions, and Russia introduced counter-sanctions in response. So maybe it's the counter-sanctions that are driving people's views rather than the US sanctions. 
Then we said since 2014, the U.S. has levied economic sanctions against Russia in response to the incorporation of Crimea into Russia. So uh, we wanted to measure, see if, what effect this had. Uh, now we had a couple of other questions about U.S.-Russia relations being at a bad point. And then we also had this question, which turned out to be quite interesting. Many experts believe that Donald Trump will weaken, weaken economic sanctions against Russia once he takes office. Why, so, do, why do you call them questions? Uh, oh, sorry. You're right. They're just treatments, not questions. Sorry. Thank you very much. These are all just um, uh, treatments. The questions are what come afterwards when we talk about uh, um, you know, how giving people this information influences their Perfect. Influences their attitudes towards Russia, the U.S., and the EU. And again, we see that there's, this time we see a slightly positive effect, but again, it's not, not really different from zero. But what really drives in people's views is uh, sanctions toward, that, that reminding people that the sanctions were done because of Crimea really lifts support for the Russian government. So it seems that people are really <coughs> responding not to the sanctions, but to the reason why sanctions were put in place uh, in the first place, Crimea rather than the sanctions. Right? Also, there's some evidence that um, uh, a change in support. Um, uh, uh, I'll, get to, I'll get to that, get that in a second. OK, so again, no direct effect of sanctions. The rally around the flag is happening because of Crimea, not because of sanctions. And weakening sanctions increases support uh, for the target. It also increases support for the United States um, as well. So in thinking of, about what the policy implications are, um, you know, critics will say, that, oh, we shouldn't do sanctions because of the rally around the flag effect. And we don't find much evidence of that here. Um, but there's also not much evidence that people are really withdrawing support uh, uh, because of the sanctions. So arguments about sanctions then should be made about other, um, uh, another dimension, such as are they signaling resolve to the Russian government? Um, you know, it's it probably the case that the big impact that sanctions have is that they're signaling U.S.-European cooperation on this issue and resolve to Russia rather than working through uh, public opinion. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I escaped. Yeah, get that on. Um, is this, is this, close this, that. Close that window. Close uh, the Okay. Wow, this is super <coughs> sensitive. Double click. Mm -hmm. right, and then F5. Hit the slideshow. Okay. Slideshow? Can you go to slideshow. slideshow up at the top? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You kind of left the left left the clips hanging a little bit on yeah, the actually, that. Yeah, actually, hit that with your finger. Yeah. I think it works. Maybe oh, we can just do it. Yeah. What Russians no, would think no. okay, about uh, um, their their, click, their click um, economic uh, outlook after Trump took office? What was the answer to it? Go to where Misha oh, said. Um, click, 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 no, no, yeah, if, right. If you tell people Trump will weaken the sanctions, their support goes up for the Russian government, and their support for the U.S. government goes up. Okay, um, our final presentation of this panel will be from Adam Stolberg from Georgia Tech, who's going to be talking about extricating from the energy sanctions tangled gas networks and off ramps to escalation in US EU Russia relations. Right, and so my memo really starts from the point that my colleagues have identified, which is we find ourselves now at a juncture where the United States and Europe are double downing on energy sanctions and energy statecraft on Russia at a time when. Those sanctions really aren't bearing the desired results. Uh, they seem to be also offering no off-ramps. Uh, and as a result, they're generate, they're not only suboptimal in the short term, uh, but potentially dangerous and escalatory over the longer term. Uh, and there are a number of reasons that my colleagues have touched on, on these things. Uh, but what's really interesting actually about the current round of sanctions is that energy is actually featured prominently. Uh, and not just oil and future deals, but also uh, export arrangements, export pipeline uh, deals. So there are, it is being uh, featured much more. Uh, and it, these sanctions are, as I mentioned, not only costly and risky, uh, but they're, they can be affected by other exogenous factors like changes in oil prices that may, have, that may be affected by behaviors outside of the sanctioned party's behavior. Uh, and as a result, we have a bunch of interlocking dilemmas whereby 
the, the US government, the EU, and even Russia, they all have to uh, bargain in a context where sanctions are in place. So they have to uh, simultaneously de demonstrate discriminating pressure on the other, while, so while but constrained, and as we heard uh, by Misha, by institutionally, the, the uh, Trump administration is now narrowed, it has more circumscribed space and discretion, uh, given that con Congress now has a mandated role, uh, to signal reassurance. And so this is a real challenge. So how do we extricate ourselves from this, uh, this context? Well, uh, in a nutshell, in my memo, I try to say the first thing we need to do is recognize that sanctions are here to stay and so that the bargaining will have to take place against that backdrop. And it's not really about demonstrating credibility of a threat to issue sanctions, which is a lot of what the literature focuses on, what, under which conditions will sanctions be effective, but it's how to sustain uh, these sanctions while simultaneously uh, being able to signal uh, reassurance and provide off-ramps to, to extricate. Uh, so how do we, you know, what is to be done in this context? Uh, and I would argue that much of the discussion about sanctions, and especially energy sanctions, uh, has been occurring in a vacuum, almost without uh, regard for how the energy landscape is actually transforming. Most of the discussions are sort of assume relative power and point-to-point -point kinds of interactions, looking at who's uh, providing energy, oil or gas, in one end of a pipeline and who's consuming it, uh, but not uh, appreciating that we're seeing an increasing uh, network uh, structure of relationships that are really changing uh, power, influence, and leverage uh, in these relationships. So that's what I try to explicate in the in the context of this memo. And so, uh, for the, for brevity's sake, the, the the memo then shifts to uh, trying to understand what's dysfunctional about the current uh, sanctions regime. And I think my colleagues have covered a lot of it. Uh, but suffice to say, I see that there are basically uh, three levels of problems. Uh, with the Western sanctions. One is it's not clear what the objective is and the conditions would be for the success. Uh, you know, we've issued successive rounds of sanctions, but we haven't seen changes in the behavior. In the energy area, we've actually seen Russia uh, uh, reach its post-Soviet high of production in oil and uh, actually increase its uh, 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 deliveries and market share uh, marginally uh, in Europe while sanctions have been in place. So it's not clear that they're bearing uh, any results. But they really ponder, I mentioned, uh, due, to, due to the lack of real uh, clear understanding of what uh, the objectives are and what the measures of success would be. They're, they were all over the map on that. Uh, another problem is that our sanctions have not really taken into account the compensatory behavior uh, that Russia has taken financially, in the macroeconomic uh, sphere, institutionally. Uh, tried to actually play switch from maximizing revenues to maximizing market share uh, and to e uh, accelerate its efforts to try to uh, land uh, or, or cement some of these pipeline deals. Um, and a third uh, set of problems, and I think Tim's uh, work speaks to this, is that there's been collateral damage, un unexpected or unanticipated un uh, effects. Uh, one of them being uh, that these sanctions actually have, sh have taken some of the heat off of uh, Putin and laid some of the, uh, put, put uh, the U.S. and the EU in the crosshairs of the Russian public. Uh, it's led to some de-risking behavior on the part of uh, uh, Western and U.S. firms. Uh, the, there's a famous State Department paper that sort of look, tries to disaggregate the impact of sanctions and it looks at how sanctions have, tar have affected specific Russian companies and specific Russian sectors, and then they've looked at offsetting imp impact on EU GDP, but they haven't looked at the impact on specific European firms uh, and specific sectors, and we see that there is uh, some, off, uh, some, uh, some collateral damage in that regard. Also, there's, uh, we see, and there's a RUSI paper that just came out that talks about how we're really on a collision course between the U.S. and the EU in terms of our interpretations of the sanctions as they become sustained. We have generally a broader interpretation, they have a narrower interpretation, and in the energy se sector they uh, have a grandfathering clause, in other words, they're not going to go after businesses that already exist as opposed to the, to the U.S. perspective. So there's some problems here. That said, and I think it's important that we uh, acknowledge this, that the sanctions are, not, notwithstanding the suboptimality and potential risky uh, implications, they're here uh, to stay. And you just heard uh, from Misha why there's some institutional constraints uh, 
uh, in the United States case, and there's a need to sort of demonstrate resolve irrespective of the costs or risks. Uh, there's this bi uh, bipartisan opposition convergence uh, towards the executive branch. Uh, the EU really doesn't have many other viable uh, alternatives uh, to demonstrate uh, uh, their resolve, uh, and they also are paralyzed by uh, some of the divisions, and you can see this over the Nord Stream uh, pipeline issues. Uh, and similarly, Russia, uh, too, uh, has a tendency to favor uh, the near-term versus the long-term effects. Uh, they tend to talk about their solvency and their short-term ability to maintain their solvency without dealing with the long-term liquidity problems that may compound structural uh, problems down the road. So sanctions are upon us uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. That said, as I mentioned, there's a big change going on in especially the natural gas uh, landscape. And many people talk about uh, the shale revolution and the changing political <laughs> geography of supply and demand. But I would argue that the, the LNG revolution is actually uh, more yeah. significant in this particular case because you're, it's, it's changing the way that, uh, that gas can be delivered and, and the intersection between LNG, storage facility, and pipelines is creating a much more dynamic landscape such that we're moving from point to point pipeline politics to a more network uh, context of interaction. So when we think of Europe today, it's no longer those three or four major cross-border pipelines going into Russia, but it looks something more like this, uh, which is really a network. Um, and that then warrants a different way of thinking about uh, power, influence, and leverage. And I've written about this elsewhere, so I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, get bogged down in some of the esoteric issues about pipe, uh, about network issues. But uh, if we just look at uh, the space through different levels of networks, there's sort of infrastructure networks and also corporate strategic alliances, then networks between companies. Uh, it gives us a very different perspective in thinking about influence in interdependent relationships. We're on the physical side, we're sort of focusing on issues related to density and de uh, diversity and resilience, where centrality uh, of a node, and it's important in terms of its efficiency and distance uh, from other uh, important exchanges and, and dyads within that network, are more important than a specific point-to-point -point, uh, relationship. Uh, when we're talking about corporate strategic alliances, we're not just talking about the flows of revenues uh, between companies, but it's the trusted social capital that exists uh, between companies. Uh, and so, uh, and, and how important uh, one company is to the ecosystem uh, existing within the natural gas and, and geographically defined areas. So again, it's, not, it's this uh, notion of centrality or in particular betweenness uh, that matters more than market power uh, in, in these relationships. So what does all that mean for the energy landscape between Russia and Europe? And uh, what I want to do is show you some uh, the findings of some research that we've been doing trying to map the infrastructure networks uh, and, and the corporate strategic uh, networks. So if we look at um, the northern part, if we disaggregate Europe and we look at sort of northern Europe and Russia, we see a very uh, classic story where uh, the German hubs and, and Russian uh, uh, hubs are actually quite significant uh, from an infrastructure level. And here we're measuring these hubs by capacity of the infrastructure, the LNG pipelines and storage facilities. So we're not looking at flows, uh, which is what a lot of people look at, because if you're a decision maker, uh, if you're in the business, Flows matter because they symbolize efficiency. If you're a decision maker, you're looking for optionality. And so what we're trying to do is look at uh, geographic distance and capacity. And you see a story that we all know that Russia and Germany are very important. But when we use a measure of centrality that takes into account uh, between the scores relevant to other important actors within the network, we see uh, the incremental role that Poland uh, and the Baltic states play with just a little bit of access to LNG. And we actually see, saw that play out with even the discussion of a floating LNG facility, not to mention it's it being turned on, it brought down prices about 26% uh, overnight. Uh, so this, this has an impact. But then when we go uh, into uh, the southern part of Europe, we see that uh, uh, Romania and, and Hungary uh, play uh, very important roles. But again, when we look at the, the impact of these hubs relative to other important uh, 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 hubs within this ecosystem, we see that, um, Austria, that Hungary is especially 
important, largely because it has links not only to Russia, but to Austria and to Europe's gas sink, which is Italy. Uh, so you see a different uh, picture than by just looking at uh, flows of, of gas when you look at the capacity. But I think the real interesting story is when we look at uh, corporate st strategic relationships. And here we're measuring trust uh, between companies measured by the different levels of FDI, where we code a very weak trusting relationship would be like a licensing agreement that has low transaction costs for breaking, uh, as opposed to joint R&D uh, and uh, joint ventures that actually are quite sticky. Um, and when we code for those things and we again disaggregate uh, the region, we see an interesting picture. One, we see that when we look at all of, when we look at the companies that are operating in this, these uh, general uh, areas, we see that Gazprom is actually central uh, to uh, the corporate strategic relationships in that broader space. But when we disaggregate it to, uh, to uh, the northern part, uh, we see that Gazprom, again, is quite uh, uh, central and quite, is seen as basically a trusted party, especially for German firms, uh, Finnish firms, and Norwegian firms. But a surprise, there are a couple of surprises here. One is Polish firms. Uh, that uh, Polish firms, are, are, are their transactions are highly influenced uh, and affected by uh, Gazprom, largely because of uh, their interaction with German companies. Uh, big German companies. But one thing that's also interesting about this diagram is you don't see the Baltic states anywhere. Uh, and that the, Balt in the Baltic states, buy, you know, were buying a lot of gas uh, from Russia, yet they were not uh, trusted parties with each other and very low scores on, on social capital. Uh, but when we go uh, to the southern corridor, uh, we see another interesting phenomenon. We see that uh, Gazprom is really central to this ecosystem and the companies that operate uh, in this space. Uh, but we also see a party that is generally gets relegated to the margins when we talk about flows. Uh, Sokar in Azerbaijan, right, uh, one of the problems that we see with the getting the pipeline off the dime is that we're talking about 10, 15 BCM uh, that's not seen to be possibly worth its while in constructing. Uh, but when we look at corporate strategic relationships and trusted parties in this space, we actually see that Sokar is, is really on par with uh, Gazprom. Uh, so what does all of this mean for the topic at hand? Well, one, it means that um, we're dealing with uh, a, a situation where, one, uh, sanctions are a reality, and it's no longer about demonstrating credibility of a threat to impose sanctions. It's now about sustaining sanctions, okay? And how are you going to do that in an effective way, an effective being not only to exert discriminating pressure on the target, but also to signal reassurance uh, and, uh, and a way to get out of this uh, once the behavior, to, to, to create the incentives for the desired compliance. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, well, one way to do that is to think about aligning our national security and market incentives together. Uh, and that takes us to this story that I just mentioned to you. Here, that when we look at the bigger picture and we don't just look at revenues and flows of gas, but we look at uh, corporate strategic relationships and how companies see each other uh, as friends or not, uh, you'd see a very different picture. You see that Russia may be down, uh, as we see there are other emergent hubs, both as an infrastructure uh, context as well as trusted parties, but they're not out. Gazprom is central uh, to uh, these ecosystems. Uh, and Russian gas hubs are obviously very important, uh, primarily uh, in the northern region. Uh, so what are, what are, how do we do this? How do we reconcile these, problems, these challenges of exerting discriminating pressures while uh, reassuring when, when parties are willing to, to actually engage? Well, I would argue that we focus less on targeting specific uh, suppliers or supply routes, like specific uh, uh, pipelines, or preferred pipelines, or whether or not U.S. LNG should be targeted uh, to a particular destination, but rather focus on building out the resilience of these networks. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are several critical hubs, both at the infrastructure side and at the trusted party uh, side, that, can, that warrant more attention to, to build those things out. And that can be done through a combination of tax breaks, preferential loan guarantees. Uh, actually, we may want to think about the story of the BTC pipeline uh, that no one thought would ever be cost effective, but through these various types of indirect effects, we, we aligned our national security and market incentives uh, together. Uh, we also need to think about leveraging some corporate capital, not again just to, at looking at what revenues are you exchanging, but look at who are the trusted parties. Uh, 
Uh, and as I mentioned, when we go into the southern corridor, it may not be about 1015 BCM. It may be about Sokar being actually a potential trusted party, especially for Italian uh, and Turkish firms. Uh, and so I find myself at the very end going back to where some of, some of my colleagues, like Per Hegelius and uh, several others, who said, pointed and reminded us that even during the worst periods of the Cold War in the 50s, 60s, and in the precursors to detente, natural gas was actually a springboard for cooperation and what emerged as detente. We now sort of think about natural gas, weapon, and energy diplomacy, but I would argue that this may be where we need to go because there are ways that we can take indirect action that can have that can raise the cost to adversaries, yet not foreclose options uh, for engaging. Because I would argue that down the road, we may want to engage uh, Russian independence in building out some of this diversified infrastructure in Europe that may create incentives in Russia uh, to, go th to embark upon the liberalization uh, efforts as they see fit down the road. But I don't see any kind of uh, non-commercial uh, detrimental impact of doing that, especially since the companies already have these trusted relationships with each other. So I'd be happy to take questions after. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. We started a little bit late on this panel, so let's take some time for questions here. So what questions? Yeah. Cole. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I think this is the great panel. As you perhaps remember, Putin in his memoirs in 1999, uh, uh, remembered the episode when he put the rat into the corner, and finally she did attack him. I think that in terms of domestic politics, perhaps, if you are not a Donald Trump supporter, you should applaud to what has happened with regard to sanctions. In terms of foreign policy, I think you lost the very serious weapon, and there is nothing you can now use against Russia, and you did implement Win lose game, uh, which will be good for you if only Russia will lose entirely, which is pretty hard to imagine. What do you think about the future of sanctions and the regime of sanctions, and how is it possible, if possible, once again to restore the importance of this leverage? Let's maybe take a couple, a few questions at once. Uh, Kim. Yeah, my question is for Tim Fry. Um, and Tim, it's about the question that you asked concerning Crimea. And the conclusion that you drew from that was that it was Crimea that mattered and not the sanctions that mattered and getting people to talk about things. But in order to know that, wouldn't you have had to have a separate question that talked about Crimea without talking about the sanctions? Because in fact, the way that I interpret this is that Crimea is what really gets at Russian nationalism. Um, and what it's doing is connecting nationalism and sanctions together and saying that, yes, when you raise the nationalism specter, yes, mm -hmm. then it means that people are anti-US and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I'm with the Executive Intelligence Review with uh, the Bruch, who's been very involved in the Silk Road projects. And I wanted to ask you, because most of the presentations are about Russia, Europe, mm -hmm. and the US. But of course, President Trump's trip this week is Asia. And the meeting with Putin is in the context of his meeting with Xi Jinping, which was extremely supportive. And Xi Jinping's proposal of, that the U.S. join these huge infrastructure projects, including taking uh, these proposals to take U.S. treasuries, U.S. debt from China and Japan and recycle them into investment in infrastructure in the U.S., which is very important for Trump's infrastructure proposal domestically, but my, my question is this, I mean, when the, when the sanctions first hit, actually the relationship of Russia and China became closer. Question, we need a question. Well, I mean, isn't it the right. case right. that this shift out of the geopolitics that's been the dominant uh, approach over the last number of years into this win-win approach of Russia, China, and the U.S. and the Silk Road changes everything? And, and, and what do you think Okay, about that's that? a question. Yep. Yes. Yeah, uh, question to Arnold Stumbel. Um, could you comment on the possible uh, value of the sanctions in increasing United States market share mm -hmm. in gas imports to Europe and preventing any realization of any version of the Southern Stream? And yeah, Regina? Yeah, so I'm sorry to do this, but I have three political science questions. <laughs> um, okay. So the first one, um, 
Misha, a long time ago, John Aldrich and Dave Rohde had another paper called Dancing Before a Blind Audience that sort of argued that foreign <laughs> policy, that Congress could do what it want, wanted on foreign policy because people just didn't care. Constituents weren't that engaged. And I wondered how that played out in the context of your paper. Tim, I, you talked a little bit about the generalizability of oh, this yeah. work. And, and I'm actually really interested in what you think about the Russian context and the, the extent to which this tells us something about sanctions more generally. And um, finally, about trust. So I think I might not be understanding the trust measure entirely, but it seems to me that it's an outcome for which trust is an important input but not the only input. And that um, the outcome you're measuring may have to do with things that you've already left out, like market share or influence and, and those kind of things. And I wondered if you could talk about that. OK. Any other from the audience? All right, so then I'll take one last question, which is that I want, it's almost like a dialogue between Misha and Adam, which is, to what extent, Adam, if you're right that these are suboptimally designed sanctions, to what extent does that play into the political calculus that led to these sanctions being codified into law in the United States at all? Right, like Misha, in your work, what did, you know, like, at, do we think that there is a political solution to finding less suboptimal sanctions, or are these sort of two parallel tracks? If there was a political track on we are going to respond by we're going to tie Trump's hands on the sanctions, and there's an economic track about that's much more complex about how these things are going to play out and things. So are you just sort of setting the scene for us, or is there actually a way for these things to dialogue with each other? And, and now that you guys have all these questions. Um, yeah, 30 take, seconds of Yeah, well, no, we can do. <laughs> we, this is actually the only bit of the schedule where we had a little bit built into it. So um, you guys can take you know, two or three minutes apiece, but pick one or two things that you want to answer. And we, we'll go in reverse order. So, yeah. OK, about US exports uh, and targeted LNG to Europe, my understanding is that it's not affected Russia's market share. Russia has marginal cost advantages of landing more gas cheaper to Europe than Actually, they benefit from low oil prices uh, more than anybody else. And so they, it, it, it even displaces Henry Hub uh, uh, op options. So that's one thing. I don't think they have done that. I think South Stream was dead before the, the U.S. Uh, export opportunity emerged. Um, but I do think there is a negative impact of this, this targeting of exports, of U.S. exports, because it's undermining the credibility of our behavior. Um, it, the Europeans are reading this increasingly as an attempt by the U.S. to, to manipulate the, the Russia issue for more market share. Uh, and that's going to cause more div divisiveness within the, uh, between the EU and uh, the EU member states and uh, the U.S. So I think this does have this adverse consequence when we're talking about sanction regime that's going to be, that's going to be here for a while. So this is, this is not a very strong read for us. Um, with respect to the social capital issue, what I'm actually measuring is what most people do in the corporate world is they, uh, for a measure of knowledge transfer. That's what the, what, what we're basically doing is disaggregating FDI. Uh, and it doesn't match well with, I mean, it, it's hard to know what, what, what are you measuring for market power and, and uh, when. These are sticky relationships that, that, that maintain themselves over a long period of time. We also measured this against the, the the duration of a partnership uh, over some, in some cases we have some data on people flowing uh, between that are not tied to uh, the market, uh, the price uh, uh, and, the, and the revenues uh, side of the ledger. In terms of the, the last point, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you're saying, but I do think there were, they are parallel tracks. But what's very interesting is that until very recently, energy was kind of off the table. I mean, we yeah, had, there was oil, but it was sort of on future deals, and there was no gas uh, tied to these sanctions. Now, uh, these are part of it. And so I, I think you know, they were parallel, but I think that we, now that we're in this mess, that the energy side of the ledger can help us get out of it because there are actions that we can take that help us square this this circle of exact you know raising the costs in Russia for their behavior without directly challenging their market share that's going to stoke some sort of overreaction uh, and they can actually we can actually induce them to build to invite them when the time is right 
to participate into this yeah. infrastructure because they're not going to have any monopoly uh, capacity in, 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 you know, to, to use this for extra commercial And that's purposes. because of the LNG. Right. Sure. That's because of the network set of relationships at the infrastructure level and at the company level. Right. Tim? Um, great. So on generalizability, I'm skeptical that the results generalize uh, uh, to most sanctions cases because I think most Russians, when they think about the sanctions, they think about them less through an ec economic prism and more through a great power rivalry uh, and, and <coughs> frame. And I think that's really what's driving uh, uh, the responses. On um, uh, sanctions and their impact on Russia-China relations, well, I think this is where a lot of people made a mistake in thinking, oh, this is really going to drive the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. Because what happened in, in terms of financing was, you know, when the, the Russians lost the opportunity to use Western finance for these big capital projects, they had to turn to the Chinese. So what did the Chinese do? They said, this is great. We're a monopoly supplier of capital. So they, you know, jacked up the prices that they could then, uh, the rates at which they were willing to lend money uh, to Russia. So China was the, the big winner, and I don't think, you know, I mean, the, the, the relationship is, you know, more complicated and multidimensional. But just on that score, you know, China was the big winner, and they've exploited that advantage um, uh, quite a bit. Um, Kim's question on Crimea is exactly right. Um, uh, it would be, if, and I've done this, you know, as always when you do a survey, you know, the, the question that you want to ask is the one that, you know, that, that, that you didn't. Um, uh, but I can say that in the comparing the question about U.S. sanctions and Crimea, if you compare that response to the question just about U.S. sanctions as the baseline rather than the no information treatment, then I think you do get the ability to make a comparison about the direct impact of sanctions, uh, direct impact of Crimea, you know, controlling for reminding people about the sanctions. But you're right, it would have been cleaner and more elegant to do it just in a, in a direct question. Um, and on the, the, the future regime sanctions, I mean, there's an interesting dichotomy, I think, here, because uh, there, there are two kind of conventional wisdoms that I think are going on here. One is that sanctions are here forever. The Jackson Vanek experience, you know, all the dynamics that, that, that Misha uh, identified. But then there's this terrifying fear among the pro-sanctions community that the Europeans are going to bail, uh, that they're going to leave. And, you know, the predictions, you know, when sanctions were put in place was, if these last 18 months, it'll be a miracle because the, the Europeans are not, you know, going to put up with this. So, uh, you know, I don't know which of these two uh, paradigms is going to be more, um, uh, you know, dominant. But for me, I mean, the sanctions, the signaling effect of the sanctions, uh, that the U.S. and the Europeans, despite the, you know, suboptimality of the sanctions, were that the signal that, you know, annexing the, the, the territory of Crimea, meddling in Ukraine is something that is, is wrong. Uh, I think that is the main impact of the sanctions. In addition, the economic impact of the sanctions, I think, are less in the short term, but the long-term financing gap that uh, uh, as, you know, the increased costs that Russian firms have to pay to finance these big capital projects, you know, we won't see the effects on output until, you know, four, five, six years out when the projects that, you know, uh, uh, that take five, six, eight, ten years to develop, um, are not in place now that would have been in place uh, if there hadn't been for the sanctions. So the, the designers of the sanctions idea was, you know, we, we don't want to put pressure on the Russians in the short term, it's really in the long term, and then over time the, the, uh, the, the pressure might increase because of this, you know, the, just the capital intensive, intensiveness of these big, um, uh, of these big projects. Josh, I forgot to mention one yeah. thing about the China issue, if I can. Yeah. I just wanted you guys uh, to, you asked a question about China. And I actually, uh, we looked at the corporate strategic relationships between Russian firms and, and Far Eastern ones. This is, uh, there are three slides, one from 2000, one pre-2006, one between 2006 and 2009, and then one after that. And one thing that's really interesting, whoops. You see, if you bottom right, you see Russia actually is becoming increasingly a trusted player among Chinese firms, notwithstanding the haggling over price, notwithstanding potential strategic hedging that may be going on. One thing is happening is that those companies are becoming closer. Is that all, is that all Rosneft or is that uh, other that's firms? That's a big part. Well? There are other firms. Yeah.
Alicia? How many seconds do I have? Left? <laughs> 15. Uh, well, actually, my uh, take on both of your presentations is that the sanctions were not enough. Clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, they have not hurt Russia enough. Uh, they, the, they, they, they have not hurt big companies like Gazprom enough. Uh, they have not hurt the population enough. The economic cost hasn't been hard. Part of it is, I think, because there is this, um, well, uh, two-pronged idea. One is that, well, the elites did it, you know, Putin seized Crimea and invaded East Ukraine. He wants to stay in power, therefore it's all these elites and oligarchs. So we should target them. And in the literature also, there's been a pop very popular strand in the literature on sanctions has been smart sanctions. Mm -hmm. That sanctions should, you know, avoid the general population. So, but, I think what your studies show that, that smart sanctions theory is challenged, that it doesn't work quite, that you need to hurt the general population. Sorry, guys, but we will hurt you. And, and then uh, you maybe will rethink how to re reorganize things domestically. There is an obvious off-ramp. Get out of Donbass, get out of Crimea. That's an obvious off-ramp for all of this. And so for Kola, then the question is, however, uh, even though they are set in stone legislatively, they can be at it. You know, what if the investigation, the, the wheels of American justice grind slowly but extremely fine? What if we do find actually evidence that votes were changed? Because 70,000 votes margin in three states is very suspicious to me, uh, especially considering the kind of hacking attacks and approaches on companies that counted the vote, provided software for vote counts, right? So something even more sinister than Volshevnik Churov. You don't know. And then uh, another thing in Congress is that there is a tendency toward issue clustering, right? Something may happen in Syria. Something may happen in Korea, right? There, there can be another wave of uh, sentiment than, hey, you know, what we've done is not enough. Look, they're still doing business with the Germans. You know, they're still supporting Putin. And they're doing all these nasty things to us. You know, let's pass another act. So I, I, I am going to say that that certainly um, doesn't close all the doors uh, on what the, the, the future of the sanctions can be in terms of Russia. As far as the blind, I love the blind audience, uh, the before audience. the blind audience. I would say it was, in this case, I would call the book Dancing Before the Half-Blind Audience. <laughs> because on the Democrat side, you see actually a huge spike in interest. Mm -hmm. So for them, it's really, on the Republican side, you see more of a, softening of interest and so it, that that would be an interesting kind of dynamic to explore there yeah okay please join me in thanking the panelists for a very <laughs>